over here. Thanks. Uh, Madhuri, you can go ahead. Good afternoon, Swapnil sir and Rajesh sir. Welcome to our webinar series, Odyssey, A Journey to Excellence. As Nelson Mandela rightly said, the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Today we have amongst us two esteemed alumni of our college, Mr. Swapnil Sahu and Mr. Rajesh Sarangi, who will enlighten the students and help them determine their right career paths. On the behalf of the XIMB family, it is our honor to welcome you, sir. Our first speaker for the session is Mr. Swapnil Sahu. Mr. Sahu is currently the Senior Manager of Global Partnerships and Inbound Sales Support in a leading Gartner-recognized mobility organization and is an esteemed alumnus of the Class of 2013 of Xavier Institute of Management, Bhuvaneshwar. Characterized as a transformative leader and a change agent with very strong ownership skills, Mr. Swapnil has been responsible for the company's partnership routes to market and inbound sales strategy globally with over 15 years of experience. He is well-versed in identifying growth opportunities, go-to market strategy and execution, as well as new product direction and acquisition. Mr. Swapnil is passionate about learning, coaching, and above all, an enthusiastic mentor. Our second speaker of the session is Mr. Rajesh Sarangi, a management professional and a business consultant with over 12 years of industry experience in both domestic and international markets. Mr. Sarangi is an esteemed alumnus of the class of 2013 of Xavier Institute of Management, Bhuvaneshwar, and has worked in the automobile industry in commercial vehicle, as well as passenger vehicle segments. He served in various capacities with MNCs like Daimler Trucks Asia, Tata Motors, and Deloitte. His area of expertise is international business, where he takes care of product strategy and project management. He also advises startups, takes active interest in industry academia interface. He would be sharing his experience to guide the students in their career paths. With lots of enthusiasm, I welcome you on this platform on behalf of the XIMB family. Today, both the speakers will guide us and enlighten us on the topic, partnerships and alliances, building a resilient partnership model in a post-pandemic world. Taking the proceedings forward, I would now request Mr. Swapnil Sahu, sir, to enlighten us with his words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sai, uh, Madhuri, and it was lovely hearing the introductions from you and Anubhav, and thank you so much, the XIMB alumni team, for arranging this, and I hope it's worth your while. So, um, guys, what I'll do is I will share my screen here, and uh, let me know if you're able to view my our presentation. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, uh, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, guys, we'll try to make it very interactive, uh, you know, session, and we have roughly around 35, 40 odd minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A round. And depending on the momentum we have, we can extend or, you know, we can have a next session sometime later. Right. So, uh, you know, so, so first of all, thank you, Rajesh, for also uh, chipping in here and clubbing together. So the, uh, the agenda is broken into two parts here. The first is on, you know, as Sai Madhuri told about the partnership model that we are speaking about in a post pandemic world. The Corona is the name of the game now. And how do you want to improve from there? How do you want to take it forward is uh, we will be discussing here. And then next is and most importantly, uh, you know, this is a sneak peek and we have been doing it with a lot of institutions and universities, you know, earlier. So, so basically how well you are prepared for the experience, for the placements and, uh, you know, for your SIPs. And, you know, we'll just try to show you what we have been doing with others. And, you know, if, it, if that interests, then, you know, we can definitely take it forward from there. Right. And before we, you know, start a quick statistics, guys, can you please open www.menti.com on your laptops and enter the code on the screen, which is 26910069. Uh, we have Rajesh there. Rajesh has only two questions for you guys there. And it would have it would give us a good idea to know the statistics of the whole batch here. I understand we have a first year, second year and a couple of streams. Can we quickly do it in the next 30 seconds? Uh, Rajesh, I hope uh, 
the code is yeah, the same. Just, that is yes, that's the same code of Nelson. Just type www.menti.com, M E N T I. We go to the page, we have to enter this code. We have two questions, multiple choice questions, just to understand the statistics of how the participants. And I'll be able to see it on my screen. Yes, we have. We are getting quite a good number of response now. Great. So, so Rajesh, what yeah, does this tell about? Uh, Sapnil, I'll just take 30 more seconds uh, because uh, we have 133 participants and so far uh, around 60 have uh, voted. So I'll sure, sure. wait for another 15 seconds for all of them to vote and I'll pass. Uh, sure, sure, Rajesh. Let's do that. Yeah. So the statistic says that uh, uh, 40%, over 40%, not 45, 45% students are interested in sales and marketing. That's pretty good to know. That's pretty good to know. 30% students are interested in finance, 20 in operation, and 5% in system and IT. I guess we have no presentation from HR or uh, others because uh, others had kept it for the people interested in business because they want to start their own venture. But uh, since it has come to a stability now, we have 45% for sales and marketing, 30 for finance, and 20 for operation. That's pretty good. We'll go to the next okay. question you can see on your screen. Uh, that's just to understand how many of you are from first year and how many of you are from second year. So I told you we discussing on the uh, part of the society or part of joining a company as a management training or uh, Rajesh, I think your voice is a bit breaking away. Uh, guys, are you able to hear Rajesh clearly? Please let us know. Uh, no, sir, it's a little bit. It's breaking a little bit. Yeah, Rajesh, it's breaking a little bit. Okay. Uh, uh, can you see the second screen now? Okay. Uh, so, uh, guys, I hope you would have answered your better. second question as well. Uh, right, Madhuri? Yes, sir. The second question is answered. Yeah, yeah, Rajesh. May, uh, I think you can uh, give us a quick statistics on the second question as well. I think uh, Rajesh is still connecting. The problem Yeah, uh, I think Rajesh, uh, there's a bit of a voice, uh, you know, audio issue there. If you can fix it, and l l let's move on. You know, we'll come back to the second question later on. You know, which is basically a percentage between the first year and second year, and how many uh, are there? Uh, maybe you know, Madhuri, you can give us a good idea. How many of uh, you know the batch over here are from first year, and how many are from the second year? Sir, most of them are from first year. We have a few from the second year as well. Okay. The okay. From the first. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. So, uh, guys, I think you have already given us an introduction. I will not repeat it for the sake of time. Right. And I just wanted to tell you, you know, I and Raj, uh, Rajesh, we thought of creating this kind of web series for called Hot Fusion, and uh, we have been doing it consistently for all the baby IMs and you know a couple of universities, local universities in and around Odisha. Right. And we just thought that, uh, you know, this is a not for profit organization. And we thought that what benefit we can bring it to our alma mater. And this is where we are. So, you know, let's begin with our, you know, main theme over here, which is on the partnership. So, you know, guys, there are two ways of uh, enjoying a subject. The first is, of course, you know, trying to understand it for the love of the subject. Right. And the second is, you know, trying to do it to understand, you know, uh, to understand that you have a particular objective to meet, right? And over here, the objective for the second year guys who are not yet placed would be on the exuberance. For the first year guys who are, you know, approaching the SIP, it would be on those perspective. And we have taken here the theme of the second perspective, right? We have a placement and for getting into, uh, you know, for, for making a good impression on the interviewer. And if the topic is on partnership, if the job description is around Alliance Manager, you know, how you should take it forward, right? And please feel free to stop me. Please feel free to stop myself and Rajesh and let us discuss more about it, right? Uh, I hope Rajesh, your audio is better now. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I think yeah, it is still breaking away, uh, Rajesh. Maybe uh, you know uh, if we can use a mobile or uh, you know stuff like that, that would help. Meanwhile, sir, I will continue uh, with the uh, Rajesh. Sir, can uh, just uh, the microphone on and switch off the video? I think that's going to work. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that will be a good idea. You can switch off the video. Right. So, so guys, let's start. You know, hopefully like, that will give some mind break. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, Rajesh. Right. So, guys, let's start. You know, uh, so, so tell me, guys, uh, what do you mean by partnership, or uh, you know, uh, where does a partnership fit into, uh, let's say, a IT SaaS product base or a service based industry? Right. So, so where do you think this partnership comes into the play? A quick. First top, you know, uh, five, uh, you know, guys, if you can answer it in next uh, 20, 30 seconds would be great. Please volunteer yourself and let me see the screen. So the question is in your SIP or in your exuberance, if a partnership job description is there, what do you expect a partnership manager would do, a channel partner would do? Anyone? Uh, students can raise their hand and we'll call them out. Yeah, that would be a good idea. We have 30 odd seconds for this. Uh, Sonali Pandey, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Good morning, sir. I'm Sonali Pandey from XIMB, BM Batch. Yeah, hi, Sonali. Uh, I'm not sure, but I would like to take an educated guess. So I think uh, uh, basically a formal arrangement between the managers in order to take decision or to arrive at a conclusion. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Uh, I appreciate your effort, but that's not the right answer. Uh, anybody else? What is a need of a partnership manager in an organization? Or let we'll me put it in this way. Please. Why would Netflix as a company need a partnership manager or Facebook need a partnership manager? Or for that matter, Deloitte or Cognizant would need a partnership manager. Uh, sir, uh, is it like we need to have collaboration between two different technologies or to different fields of management, like uh, having knowledge about technology and using it in uh, like uh, sales or marketing. So collaboration between that. Uh, that's that's very, very near. That's very, very near. And I think yeah, with this, we can end our uh, QA role play, right? So uh, yeah, uh, I think Tulsi, uh, you are up to the task here. So basically, you know, oh, the need of a partnership manager, you know, for any organization uh, comes up from two aspects. The first aspect is the partnership manager is in charge for outward, uh, you know, or forward looking, collaborations that can help an organization, right? Or, uh, and for the other matter is internally, you know, you cannot, you, you would not be able to raise your top line if you are depending only on your customers. You would need a set of partners that will help you. So for an example, let me uh, tell you this, you know, Domino's Pizza, you know, made an alliance with Hens Ketchup, right? For all their outlets globally. So can you tell me, you know, why why did Domino would do that? What was the reason for Domino doing that? You know, making an alliance. Domino could be up now, you know, ketchup bana sakta tha. Why didn't he do that? Quickly, uh, maybe you know, you guys Tulsi and you know Sonali, if you have answered it, why don't you take a stab here? Or anyone else? Uh, cross selling is all I'm aware of. Very good, That's very good. So this is the keyword, guys. Cross selling is the keyword. If you say your interviewer would be impressed. So, uh, you know, my focus over here would be for people who are about to face an interview, have the right keywords, have the right knowledge, basic knowledge and move it forward. Fine. So, you know, the, the thing over here is, you know, Domino is not in a business of making, you know, uh, ketchups. It's in a business of doing a pizza. Hence, ketchup is in a business of doing, you know, ketchup. So a person who is, uh, you know, a person who is focused on what he's doing best would be able to do its best over there. You know, if you get it spread across, uh, you know, if you, if you check the whole spectrum, your 
you know power your value would be diluted and this is the reason why you know a, a netflix which is a basically a over the air you know video you know content sharing uh, you know application or facebook which is a social media platform would not necessarily get into something which is let's say you know getting a survey out getting you know if how fast is the internet speed you know or how fast is the uh, you know otp coming to your mobile when you're doing the first level registration you know those kind of services would be outsourced to certain of their partners and this is what is partnership all about it's a pretty simple concept it's not rocket science but what it requires is continuous follow up so so you know what does a partnership manager do and this is what exactly i do in my organization you know a centralized group to have a standardized approach right so let's say in north america there is a set of partners who are signing up with my organization and my team in tokyo is not aware of the best practices so this creates a divide you need somebody who can centralize all the uh, you know policies processes and take it forward and this is what a partnership manager a global partnership manager would do and of course we have regional partnership managers based out of us based out of uk you know uh, asia pacific oceania and uh, the, that's what how it goes and the key objective is of course you know increase the reach and increase the visibility of the organization create a formal voice of partners you know finally increase the revenue through the partner channels you have strategic partnerships you know and strategic partnerships basically follow uh, there could be a technology partnership there could be eligibility partnerships like you know if you would have heard of something called google android enterprise recommended you know so that is uh, uh, that is the latest wave or trend in a mobility factor you should google this and maybe i think uh, you know this video is getting recorded so you you should play it otherwise and try to understand if those kind of companies visit you and they have this profile this is how you should do it and then there are oem partnership oem stands for original equipment manufacturer that could be a lenovo that could be a samsung you know those kind of you know hardware players who would like to bundle their hardware with a software based company you know this is how the partnership would uh, you know go forward and how do you do it so we know the why of the partnership now we know the objective and how do you do it of course you know you have to you know go on the field try to meet the customers try to meet various uh, you know people from where customers buy and scout for those partners you know partners could be your distributors could be your resellers independent software vendors right and this is how you have to channelize and make a distribution among them you know partnership as such is a very deep knowledge but as i said you know we will skim it over will not make it data intensive we'll just make it uh, for you people to appreciate the concept of partnership and of course if you have any questions we can definitely meet it on the q and a rounds right and you know uh, the other way of growing partnerships is you know having this uh, you know uh, you know regular uh, conferences or quarterly meets which we call uh, you know in our uh, lego called gear up sessions where the partners come in and they discuss with you and you become the voice of partners inside your organization right so your you get paid from your organization but you have to always protect your partners and that is the kind of vision that you bring into your organization that you are representing the set of partners for your organization and this is where it becomes very tricky when you have to do multiple stakeholder management like you have a technology department you have a you know engineering department and they would say ki hey swapnil yaar this uh, feature request cannot be done in two weeks and you would say no the partner is committed to make it in one and a half weeks and this is what you have to do so this is where is the negotiation comes into the picture this is where your you know tenacity and your authority in your organization comes into the picture and these are the soft skills that comes up and we will discuss more rajesh will discuss more towards the end of our presentation about these kind of skills and how do you get them and benefits of course is you know for your sales folks they need not worry about the non you know revenue a uh, kind of you know work which is basically training and enablement you know a partner portal so that your partners can seamlessly come and take a licenses out of it creation of marketing collaterals legal support so these are the things that a partnership manager would work into right uh, any questions so far or is it greek and latin till now so with the silence i would take it as a approval and i will move forward right so what are the ideal objectives of a partner right 
so uh, you know we can make a uh, if somebody wants to respond or it you know please feel free to cut me short and you know speak your voice i would be more than happy to you know interact with folks who are able to cut my voice and speak to me so what do you think would be the ideal objectives of a partner you know i think few of the points are mentioned over here but as a partner if you think you know just use your common sense okay i am partnering with a facebook or with a netflix and we will take those examples along and we have a case study also which is on automobiles and rajesh will drive that right so the objective is definitely yaar yeah, we need we need you know a, a good amount of revenue by doing the business the amount of effort and time we spend we would need to be neatly compensated for that uh, compensated for that right and this is where you know the ideal objectives of a partner comes up you know maximize the revenue earn margins and your rewards provide localization support to organization and a quick question here what do you mean by localization support as i said i will not make it a monologue uh, anybody quickly in next 10 20 seconds what do you understand by partners providing a localization support for <clears throat> an organization so maybe the local partners who actually help the organization in bringing the efficiency and uh, they are they actually knowing the intricacies of the local market so they may be useful to the organization right aditya yes yeah. so so basically you know your organization cannot be everywhere right so we are based out of california yeah you cannot have your you know a r and d center based out of tokyo right local partners local support groups there to help the organization move forward and it's pretty common sense agar if i cannot be at every places i be a brand ambassador for myself who can represent me and uh, yeah this is where i think aditya uh, you have mentioned it right it's a localization support uh, that means your organization cannot be everywhere but your partners could be everywhere and this is where the partnership managers ability and skill set comes in the picture picking the right partner for your geography right pretty simple uh, you know no rocket science as i said and then uh, you know generate revenue by offering services like you know proof of concept manage services training and support right so so you know a, a quick question again to everyone here right could anybody here explain me how does a product based saas company operate you know what are the high level areas on which a product based saas company would operate you know when i say product based you know netflix facebook those would be the example if not then of course i will tell it but if somebody wants to take a stab please feel free and do it i am on my screen now okay guys so i will tell you you know a, a product company what would it have it would have the core product and how do you sell a core product you sell your core product by creating licenses right so you will have a licensing division right and once you have the licensing division which is the pre sales part of it once you sell it to the customer you will have a post sales we don't have a whiteboard here otherwise i could have drawn and shown it to you uh, so this is where it happens you have a pre sales part you have the licensing optimization part you have post sales and in post sales we have you know these three uh, features which is manage services training and support you have sold your product you know they need the support they need the training on your product and this is what you would work on right and there, these are the rest of the points which is pretty much obvious you know like you we we'll have a joint target set up okay by you know 31st of december me and my partner from tokyo would be selling at least 1 million yens right so this is how you would you know approach this and definitely working on large deal and closures these are pretty much obvious right up selling and cross selling you know the lady who spoke earlier uh, she mentioned about it and across all operating systems that makes it much more versatile and easy to sell you know so what fun it would be if netflix would work only on ios ios guys right so the android users would not be able to use netflix so this is where you know this is the point that makes it universal next partner roles and responsibilities right and i would like somebody over here who would like to major in marketing or people who are making a major in marketing right now to explain me the first point marketing what do you mean and and you have the activities here how do you think these activities will help a partner 
will wait again for 10 to 20 seconds just to find the guy who speaks. I'll put it, uh, I'll put the screen here. So for marketing, we have joint events, marketing campaigns, joint webinars. My question to you guys is how do you think from marketing perspective, these features would help a partner? Now that I've given you a basic definition of what a partner is and how do you get a partner and what are its main tasks? Uh, Nishchay Hans, you can go ahead and answer. Yes, sir, I would like to give this a try. Uh, sir, I feel that joint events can help uh, companies build trust on their products with the help of the other organization. For example, if say HP launches a laptop and it does joint events of their new laptop launch and if we have someone from the Microsoft team, uh, Microsoft Teams or Intel team that can describe about what type of software is being used in the laptop that adds credibility to both the brands and the product. Excellent, excellent, Nisha. You know, had you been there on my recruit, I would have selected you. Fantastic, guys. So, one thing you have trust. And trust is very important. Let it be your personal life and professional life, right? And yeah, of course, your partners need to trust you. So that's one point. The other points, I will let me add it quickly to you. The second is lead generation. Boss, we are doing this but at the end, we need a dhanda. We need somebody who can give us money out of it, right? We just cannot go on doing and, you know, burn the money that we have. So if we are investing, you know, 100 rupees for a joint event or let's say a LinkedIn social media campaign, we would expect here yeah, we get 1000 rupees out of that. So lead generation is a very, very important factor apart, apart from trust. And last but not the least is, you know, having your coverage, you know, spreading the word, you know, spreading the good word, the way Flipkart started. Flipkart never did, you know, uh, kind of advertisements, right? It just went with word of mouth. So this is how you do it, the way Xiaomi does it, right? Word of mouth, largely not, you know, uh, the kind of advertisement that has come up recently. But yeah, this is what it is. Next is pre-sales, you know, so, uh, you know, Pre-sales, as the name suggests, is before the sales is being done. So you have the demo, you have the POC, and you have the case studies, right? So that's the part for the sales. You know, we have inbound and outbound. And now the next question, what do you mean by an inbound sale or an outbound sale? What is the difference between that? These are very pretty basic, and I am expecting somebody out there would be knowing it. Inbound sales and outbound sales. And what does it have to do with the partnership? And you can just take a stab like Nishchay did. We have next 10, 20 seconds for this. So we'll see Acharya. Uh, so like uh, in inbound sale, we need to make the sale with our existing customers mostly. And in outbound sale, we need to change our uh, like prospective customers to be our uh, like so that they would buy our products okay, okay uh Tulsi, i think uh, you know i appreciate the effort but you know the uh, definition of inbound went a bit haywire but that's uh that's okay so inbound means here jaha pe hame push karne ki zarurat nahi hai so i have an inbound sales team and inbound sales support is coming up so there is a customer out there who says ki swapnil i want to buy your product right so that would be inbound for me it's coming it's coming to me it's inbound right pretty simple basic uh, you know common sense and this is where there would be a couple of partners who would be knowing with the marketing activities you have done on step one to understand hey we we see that you know a lot of partners are getting profited with you and we want to work with you and how do we do that so they said the inbound sales and there's a kind of revenue that comes attached with it outbound means you have to push it you have to push your products to somewhere else so developed countries you know a lot of people have the me too products Right. And how do you do that? You push it across and you get your stuff done. So that's the inbound and outbound. And these are the two kind of partner revenues that comes from sales. Right. And then, of course, you have the implementation project scoping and planning and the support, which is L1, L2, L3 support. So people who have worked in TCS, Infosys, Cognizant and all those stuff would be knowing the support part there. I would not go deeper into it. And I think we are somewhere on the time here. Right. So partner benefits, you know, uh, you know, a lot of things are uh, you're pretty obvious here. You know, as we said, on the marketing side, we have the joint sales calls, demos, success stories, experience sharing that comes up with the partners. 
the partner portal is you know one of the benefit that the partners get you know we uh, so it depends from organization to organization so what we do in 42 gears and why we have named it 42 gears you would be aware if you read a book called hitch hackers guide to galaxy right it's an interesting book you read that and then you can ping me right so so what we do in my organization is you know we try to give them okay within 3 months of onboarding if you are able to sell 10000 usd we will give you a cashback of 10% right uh, you have a additional you know discount of 15 odd percent if you get somebody from our competition and by the way our competition is like microsoft vmware dell we are the only i would say indian incubated you know company who runs and rubs shoulders with all these giants over here right so the, the, these are the kind of partner benefits that i'm talking about we uh, you know of course the marketing collateral campaigns the social media posts events everything is there so uh, these are couple of points i would not go into each of these points but you know you can have a read of it and if uh, you know a, a, a kind of job description appears you can have a quick rush over this because these are the points if you say the interviewer would be impressed and i'm sure you would be selected at least for this round to move up okay uh, there's a partner onboarding uh, kit you know uh, pretty much uh, straightforward when you uh, you know close a partnership deal so let's say for example you know dominos closed a partnership with the, uh, with hands ketchup it will provide hands ketchup folks with what are the product brochures for dominos you know what is the kind of uh, you know faqs about the dominos you know uh, products that you are using you know the kind of you know hygiene they make you know and in this you know pandemic world the most and most significant part is how safely you can interact you know how safely you can uh, communicate without uh, you know getting the corona scare inside your mind right and then of course the case studies battle cards what do you mean by battle cards right so uh i would say you know battle cards are nothing but uh, a kind of brochures given to sales persons where you have a competitive analysis between your products you know between your competitors so so a battle card for dominos would definitely have that what is the usp of dominos when you compare it with pizza hut right or with you know uh, papa jones or something like that so uh, that's the point price list pretty obvious you need the price list of the you know products partner portal partnership certificate demo licenses stuff like that so i just kept the slide for there and value earnings for partners you know when i say value earnings uh, right what does what are the take away for the partners right you have product certifications you have additional margins for preferred partner meeting the targets the kind of cashback that i told you before incentives free licenses you know for star performers in a partner team and this is where your uh, you know capability as a partnership manager comes in that how closely you know the partner not only the director of the partner but also the sales executive of the partner team so this is the length and breadth that you need to think about um, the annual awards and accolades recognition and branding support these are there these are partner security guidelines right and uh, you know so when you say partner security guidelines what would happen you know so let's say in middle east in dubai you are trying to sell a product and as you know uh, middle east as such uh, it has very localized centers so you have dubai you have riyadh you have abu dhabi and these are the centers you you know you don't have much of a sale in you know kabala in uh, iraq right so this concentrated areas will have multiple partners and you have multiple partners you have multiple conflicts and how do you protect and sell and save your partners and these are the couple of partner protection plans right so so you know uh, the question would be you know the question could be to you uh, uh, for a partnership profile that uh, you know if you become a partnership manager how are you going to protect your partners and this is the answers you should speak my friends which is partner protection plan like a deal wedging so where a lead is brought in by the first partner but the uh, deal is won by a second partner so we will have a deal wedging which can be 5% 10% you know depending on the kind of scenario you have you can work it out uh, then you have a deal locking period where you know you lock a deal uh, for 60 odd days or 45 odd days and ensure that you are winning the uh, lead for this specific partner and not from the other partners because this partner has been given the privilege of a deal locking 
uh, multiple partner participation you can decide it you know how you want to do it so let's say lenovo samsung you know and apple three of them bid for the same product that you have and it would be on your discretion who with whom you would give an l1 price the lowest price and the second lowest price and then you know we have the lead migration and reallotment part of it so those are pretty much same things we are at 1237 now we'll quickly move to the partnership case study rajesh uh are you there Sapnil, can you hear me oh yes rajesh loud and clear i think this is much better over to you rajesh uh, you know for the partnership case study so friends rajesh is from the automobile industry predominantly and you know he would be selling us a very interesting skoda 2.0 partnership story uh, you know in this pandemic period over to you rajesh uh, thank you sapnil uh, guys hope i'm audible this time uh, i managed to save some bandwidth by stopping the video yeah uh, okay good afternoon uh, and first of all, thanks, Sopnil, uh, for taking us through this importance of partnership. You introduced us to the concept of upskills and cross-sell. Uh, you also spoke that partners can be everywhere, and that's very, very important. Uh, we'll see in this uh, story, uh, uh, this is a story of a brand called Skoda, which is pretty well known. So that's why I have picked up this, uh, this brand. Uh, for one of the other reason is that I don't represent this brand. So whatever data is available is in, available in public domain. So that saves me from any of my liabilities. Uh, this will be a story so, it's, it's, uh, so that you can connect it to the various strategic frameworks. Uh, whatever you've learned, the first year students uh, uh, can implement uh, the 4P, STP, and product life cycle, whatever they've learned from the book uh, while, while thinking. You'll, of course, take some questions in the Q&A. Uh, so let me come to the story um, uh, without lingering it further. So guys, uh, you might have heard this uh, quotation of Lenin. Many of uh, us say this thing that there are years when nothing happens and then there are weeks where a decade happens. So uh, this is uh, this black swan event of COVID is a similar situation where uh, the industry in particular has been hit hard, right? When I say industry, I mean the manufacturing industry because unlike the software industry, uh, the manufacturing industry is traditionally uh, rely on manpower. It's in, in India, it's a, uh, it's, it's a case where a lot of people have to be there, be it in the factory or be it in the front end for sales and marketing. I'm glad that half of the batch or half of the participants have uh, uh, shown their preference for sales and marketing. And when we uh, go through this uh, story, we'll, we'll get to know that why sales and marketing and every other department has a major role to play. And uh, when I talk about partnership here, the partnership is not only external but also internal you'll have dealer, part dealer partners you'll have vendor partners and each other department is also a partner i believe no department is an island we'll have to uh, take help from other department also and that also will be uh, uh, an example of uh, partnership so uh, just a brief background about skoda so you um, i hope you know that it's one of the largest established car manufacturer in the world uh, this company was founded in 1895 which is a legacy of 125 year old now and it's been a part of the Volkswagen Group since 1991. So uh, in India, they're operating uh, from 2001. So that's been almost 20 years now. And uh, some of their products are Skoda Super, Skoda Octavia, Skoda Rapid, and Skoda Cadillac. If I, if I uh, give you a, a background about the products, these products are predominantly placed in the 30 lakh and upper uh, uh, price range. So that will be an aspirational product for somebody. The only entry level product that they had was Skoda Rapid, which was placed around 10 lakh rupees. So that gives the positioning of the company, uh, an idea about the positioning of the company and the history of the company. Now let's come to the story of Skoda 2. So Skoda, as I told you, was present in India for almost 20 years, this Volkswagen group took, uh, together. But uh, the, if you see the average sales figure for last uh, four or five years, so they were talking around 15,000. In 2014, they sold around 12,000. Then they went to 15,000, dropped to around uh, 13,000, then moved up to 17,000. Now that, that's not a very big number, right? So if you see uh, new companies like uh, Kia uh, and uh, uh, some of the General Motors, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Morrison Garris, uh, they are coming up here and they are doing uh, quite good. So uh, the company realized India is a very big uh, market, but somehow the market share is not good. So uh, in, in sales, in, instead of the sales numbers, the market, market share is uh, more important uh, as a KPI tool because then you understand that what is the PID, the total industry volume, and how much you are able to capture. Because if I say I sold 100 numbers in India, that might be a good number for me if the volume is less. 
but the same number might be very bad in a, in a, in a market where the uh, total uh, size is extremely bad. So uh, this India 2.0 project, uh, as their CEO explains, is one of the most exciting and most promising growth markets for for India. So uh, before uh, one and a half year, uh, they decided to set course that they will secure a market share of 5% by 2025. Now I told you that 5% will be a significant number considering the huge uh, PIV that India has, the total industry volume. So that's an aspiration they um, had before two years. So in the end of 2018, they uh, took this ambitious goal of having a 5% market share and they were working on this thing. So uh, in the early 2019, they decided to merge their entire gr uh, group. Uh, you know, Volkswagen um, uh, has also other brands like uh, uh, Audi is also a part of their uh, group company. Your know, Porsche is also a part of their uh, uh, group company. There are several other marquee brands that are part of uh, their group company. But Skoda was given the task of leading it. Their company's name was rebranded with Skoda out of Volkswagen Group. So uh, that's how they started. Their leadership changed and everything was in on track. Come 2020 in January, we had Auto Expo in New Delhi, where they announced uh, a series of products that is going to come. And interestingly, uh, this was a time when the industry was going through a transformation. Uh, if you know, there is an engine norm, pollution norms. So from VS4, you are going to VS6. So basically, VS4 engines are considered more, the, uh, more uh, harmful to the environment because they release a lot of uh, toxic gases like uh, nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide and so many others. VS6 will be a uh, very uh, eco-friendly engine. So uh, this is the time the transition was supposed to happen. So they launched it in, uh, in uh, rather they announced it that uh, they will be launching new products and uh, all of them will be VS6 compliant. They will have several uh, clips, several new features and everything was on track till 2020 January. Then you know what happened. Come March, there was a complete shutdown of uh, uh, the entire country including manufacturing. So basically uh, towards the end of March and April, there was no production. Now here comes the case. So you have an ambitious project. You have invested almost uh, uh, billions of dollars. I think to be precise, they invested 1 billion euro. So 1 billion euro is invested for this project. You have production lined up. You have secured uh, maybe many of the spare parts and many of the components required for manufacturing. And here comes a situation uh, which is absolutely in black swan event and nobody is prepared for that. So how do you do? How do you proceed? Now that will be the case that we'll discuss. I will give a sneak peek about what Skoda did and how they migrated, how they coped up with the situation which nobody in the industry was prepared. And when we discuss, I'll of course say my experience in our company, in my company, how we handle that thing. But we'll take uh, this core of Skoda as an example because they are doing it in the large scale. They are doing it possibly in the largest scale that any of us in the industry are trying to do. So you, uh, I hope all of you now understand the gravity of the situation. You have billions invested and you have um, um, uh, like products lined up for uh, uh, being launched in the market, but then you cannot produce something. So how do you do your pricing strategy? How do you do your marketing strategy? Do you still go ahead and launch the products? If you don't, then what are the risks? If you do, then what are the risks? What will be your pricing? When you enter the market, we assume that they, you don't know. A lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people have already lost their job. Their incomes has gone down. So if you put an aspirational product in the bracket of 33 lakhs or 35 lakhs, then perhaps your, uh, your sales demand will go down. Then we talked about partnership. You are not going to do it all alone. You will need a lot of dealers because you are aspiring for a 5% market share. That means you need a lot of dealer partners who will be present across the country to sell your product. So Skoda had an ambitious goal that they will double their number of dealerships. So this again become a challenge. If you're a Skoda, you have deep pockets, you can survive for a few months, but your dealer partners do not have that uh, high uh, earnings or they cannot sustain for months without earning a, a single penny. Because you don't have products, you have not launched your VS6 products. The, the complete setup is stopped. So how do they pay their uh, employees? So they will be cutting on that thing and that will uh, lead to the closure of dealers. And that's the situation you don't want. So how are you going to address that thing? So these are with these challenges, uh, Skoda decided in May that they will go ahead and they will try to make things on track. Okay. So how did they do that? So I'll, I'll take you through some of the points that they have done, and then I will leave the forum open to have a question uh, answer session. And you can share your ideas, what went wrong. You can ask your question that what uh, possibly can be a situation 
uh, where unfortunate things happen. Because the models that we read are often for the predictable things, right? Uh, so the whatever framework we have in place is a copybook management guide. So you can always tell that we'll have a product life cycle. But in real life, things do not uh, happen uh, that way. That's why we need managers who manage things. So Skoda, as I told you, had announced that it will plan to have 200 sales and service points by uh, in across 150 uh, Indian cities by 2023. So that's three uh, three years from now. That might seem uh, look like a long. Uh, that might look like a longer time frame, but unfortunately, the investment cost is humongous. To set up a dealership, you need crores of rupees. You need a bit of capital. You need the land. You need infrastructure. You need people. So that will be crores of rupees. So do you have people who will be ready to invest uh, that much of amount to be your partner? And why should they be? What is your viability model for them? How do you convince them that we have uh, we have uh, other sources of earning by which you can be profitable? Because uh, if this is a situation people may not be liking to uh, purchase a product which is 30 lakhs. Okay, so Skoda decided that uh, they will work out a solution on that thing. So what they decided that they will provide initially financial support to the dealers who are their existing dealers to cover their fixed cost for the span of April to June when it was entirely stopped and they had no source of earning. So that was extremely important because as Sopnil told us that part that very very crucial for our uh, uh, business expansion goal. So if you don't take care of your partners at the time of need, they are not going to be loyal to you. So the cost of acquiring a partner is very high also. So in order to make a relationship with uh, which will be lasting and which will be loyal, Skoda decided that they will be contributing towards the fixed cost. So that was the step one that they have taken. So now that you know that things are completely shut and there is a, a possibility that people may not like a toughened uh, um, feel all the time, so uh, it's a pandemic situation. People may not like to come to your showroom and you don't want that this, that showroom will be completely stopped. So Skoda India introduced a centralized booking platform, www.buyskodaonline.co.in. So this is a virtual platform. Uh, in automotive industry, we are not at all savvy about uh, digital things because we always believe that the touch and feel is something the customer wants. Now, these kind of situation, you have to uh, rethink that whether that was the correct thing to do or that was not. So this has indeed expedited it. And Skoda decided to launch that centralized booking platform where they are giving a 360 degree view of the entire uh, car. So basically you can go there and have a virtual experience. You can ask your questions and uh, with the support of uh, the IT partners, you can. they have developed a wonderful uh, uh, user experience where they can go to each inch of the car and uh, examine that. Having done that, uh, they also decided to go ahead with the launch plan. Now, launch is a very big thing in automotive industry because this is a go-to-market strategy. How, the, if you are aware about the uh, the marketing funnel, the first uh, level of the funnel. Is so, unless your customers are aware that you have entered the market, how they are going to show interest in it. So, Skoda decided that they will go ahead with the uh, with the launch of the product. A typical launch of uh, uh, the launch of the product before the uh, pandemic uh, era was uh, typically in a five-star hotel or in a big resort where you will be flying all your uh, uh, journalists, all your big customers, all your dealer partners, some celebrity will be coming that. So it's a big ticket event where courts are spent and then a lot of media coverage uh, is done. You cannot do that in a similar situation. How do you then correct that? Skoda then, uh, Skoda then uh, they have uh, partnered with uh, Fountainhead MKTG uh, which uh, help them with a live launch uh, virtual. Okay, so basically all these people, all these stakeholders participated. It was a grand uh, event where they had all these uh, virtual tools by which they could showcase their product, the technology they had, the uh, what new features, what new, what are the advantages, what are the benefits of those features to the customers and to the potential buyers, also to the channel partners, and this gave them a good media coverage. What it could not give is a touch and feel again. Because you know there are many channels who uh, take the car, they test drive it, and then they compare. And so that kind of publicity, which is word of mouth publicity or which is first hand publicity, could not be provided through this uh, media. But anyway, that solved some of the problems, though not all of the problems. We'll touch base that uh, when we discuss in our Q&A session. Uh, now, let's come to the sustainability part. So you have launched a product. You have decided to launch a product. Okay. So uh, this is a high-end product. Uh, so how do you make sure that you have uh, uh, other sorts of earnings for your uh, uh, for your channel partners? Okay. 
So uh, what Scott as national head uh, told in a television interview is that how they are seeing this aspiration of the customer uh, will go through certain phases. So there will be a customer life cycle. For they believe that for somebody who is young, uh, he might not have the money, but he will have the ambition of owning a, um, a, a branded car, a high-end brand car. Then he will possibly want to have a second-hand car. Okay, so. Uh, after four or five years, when he's a little stable, then he will go for the entry level car. Okay, so uh, beyond a point when his earnings are substantial and he has significant amount of disposable income, then he will go to the high end cars like uh, your Superb or your Octavia. So with that thought in mind, they introduce the concept of Skoda resale. Uh, mm -hmm. Mind you, in luxury segment, resale cars are not something which is very familiar in Indian market, unlike the European market where the car in a span of ten years maybe changes uh, five hands. Because everybody owns a car in the United States or Europe. In India, the car penetration is not that high, so you don't expect the resale um, car market to be very uh, great. Okay, there is a Maruti True Value or there is a Tata resale car, but there is in the luxury segment you don't see a Mercedes and all these things being sold in a in an organized channel. So Skoda took this initiative with that customer life cycle uh, in mind that uh, they will have some uh, customers will be willing to pay uh, a good amount of premium to own a, even a resale car. So they had their 160 check checkpoints in place and they had their uh, Skoda uh, resale dealer set of in infrastructure in place. What they also introduce is, they introduce this Skoda Claimer Leads. So uh, they presume that uh, many of the customers will also be purchasing uh, cars because uh, of the uh, reason that mobility in a public transport is no longer considered a safer option. So if somebody owns a car for himself and uh, Maybe his uh, wife takes a public transport to go to her office. He might consider a second car. And for somebody who was traveling in Ola share, he might consider purchasing uh, um, uh, or uh, taking the car. So, but not, not everybody can afford Skoda car because of its price range. So they decided to introduce the leasing system where uh, there is a flexible plan, a gamut of offering. Uh, the customer can avail monthly rentals uh, for a tenure of two years, three years, four years, or five years. So there are several caveats to it and several other requirements also. But this will at least give somebody without uh, having a lot of money to spare or uh, without having a liability to own a uh, car for uh, its entire life and then resell it. Then somebody can take it as a lease for the period that they need it and own it and then give it back. So they have introduced that concept also. Uh, and after that, uh, they, uh, like I told you that they understand that somebody who owns uh, a, a resale car will also grow up and want an uh, entry level car. So they had this Vision India uh, model that, in, uh, that was in place and they decided to price it at an entry level, uh, which will be competing with uh, Kia Seltos and Hyundai Creta. The price will be in the sub 10 lakh uh, category, which uh, incidentally is the most competitive and most lucrative uh, market. Like in the mobile segment, the, the um, highest price might be going to Apple, but if you go uh, uh, to, by market share and most lucrative sector, perhaps the sub 20,000 segment will be the most lucrative one. So they decided to pitch into that. So Apple told us about localization. So uh, these are difficult times, right? The supply chain is hit hard. You are not relying on um, importing uh, the uh, key components now. Uh, the challenge uh, of importing key components is that uh, you need vessels for that thing and then borders are stopped. Uh, you need a lot of uh, uh, technical competency for importing parts. Uh, it, has to, you have, it has to be clear to custom. You need a vessel for that thing. So when your entire aviation industry is standstill and uh, uh, you don't uh, really have a smoother supply chain management and uh, how far it takes uh, to be normal is also uh, not known um, to anybody. So. Uh, in, in such a situation, localization becomes all the more important where uh, you have most of your parts. Uh, a car typically has 15,000 SKUs, uh, 15,000 components, uh, uh, excluding these uh, child parts, that is uh, subcomponents of a major part. So if they have so many parts, they at least uh, will try to manufacture 90% uh, through local vendors. The reason being uh, it cannot be 100% is there are some parts which are uh, extremely uh, complicated and refined and uh, if you want to uh, make it locally then perhaps the quality will be compromised so even achieving a 90% uh, localization is a big channel uh, big cha challenge because you need 
local vendors who will be having the competency and willingness to invest that much of amount so that they can support uh, Koda in maintaining that uh, uh, kind of uh, superiority in design. So these are the challenges, but they uh, took this challenge and uh, Skoda Auto uh, decided to have a new technology center in Pune that they have already decided, but they decided to have 95% of localization for which their vendor management team is also working. So uh, this is in a nutshell how the development has happened for one of the largest car manufacturers of the world in the last six months. What are the challenges they faced and how they tried to overcome? Now, the journey is not complete because we are still in the middle of the pandemic. There are multiple other challenges also. How they sell through will remain a question. And it is not the challenge that Skoda alone is facing. It is the challenge that uh, every manufacturer is facing. It is not restricted to automotive, but it is it, it's a similar case with uh, uh, any manufacturing industry, be it aluminum or be it uh, components or be it uh, iron and steel. Wherever you're manufacturing, the challenge is the same because uh, of the monetary constraint, because of the availability of manpower, because of the logistic constraints. So these challenges will remain. And we as managers will possibly will have to find out uh, an optimum solution, if not a complete solution to that. So there I will rest my case study and uh, leave the forum open uh, to discuss uh, further on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, for that insightful journey. And I hope, guys, you've got the two cents out of it, right? The basic, you know, bottom line that I would say is, remember, you know, a couple of case studies on partnership whenever you attend the interviews. And also for the love of the subject, you know, you can Google it out more on the Skoda 2.0 partnership in this pandemic times, right? So I think we are over exceeding the time. And this is what I was thinking for the past couple of minutes. What I'm going to do here is <laughs> we will quickly move to the next section. Thank you, of course. Uh, the next topic is about placements. And I will not take much time, you know. So these are a couple of teasers that we thought of sharing it with you. So first is on a CV workshop that we have done, you know, in a couple of institutions, right? And uh, the, good, the good part about it is that uh, you know, XMB has a fantastic one page CV format, and we all know that. And how do you improvise on that? What are the keywords that you should use? And you should influence the interviewer to ask questions on that. These are the basic topics that we speak about in this. Um, and the next is on the group discussion, of course, the do's and don'ts, you know, how to not make it a fish market and how to not overstep on somebody's toes and, you know, how to politely put across your point in various scenarios. These are the things. And I would request my good friend Rajesh. Rajesh, why don't you explain them something on this domain refresher courses and the next couple of two slides quickly. I think we have uh, five odd minutes and we will open it for the Q&A rounds. Sure. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the most important aspect uh, that I realized uh, during my uh, interaction with students is that perhaps there is a slight gap in terms of uh, the way we work in the industry and uh, what we are taught in uh, the uh, Academy. Uh, the reason being uh, um, uh, things keep on evolving in the industry and uh, what we are taught are actually frameworks that will suit to different needs, but they're certainly not the uh, Bible uh, which can be followed in every situation. Okay, so if I have to if I have to design a framework because we all do uh, this grids, we have this is a matrix and this thing. If I have to make a matrix of two by two for the things that I look in a candidate as a hiring uh, manager then I will say that uh, uh, that will have four quadrants. One will be the understanding of the job. That Sorry the to job interrupt, is. sir. Uh, sir, I think we are not able to see the slide. It's still on the Skoda uh, slide. We are not able to see another oh, slide right now. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I had the slides. So let me have... So this was the Skoda, uh, Skoda slide. I hope you're able to see it now. Yes, sir. Um, then we went, thank you. We went about the placements. And this is about the CV workshop that I was talking earlier. Right? Uh, you're recording, Hora, so you guys should be able to see it once more. Right? And this was about the group discussions thing that I was speaking about. So this, this is a teaser two out of five. And then we have three more teasers, and Rajesh is handling it from here. Over to you, Rajesh. Right. Uh... Uh, so as I was telling that in the domain uh, part, it doesn't matter uh, which domain you are uh, uh, aspiring to join. 
it could be sales and marketing finance consulting or anything and there are multiple of uh, companies uh, which are coming in the edutech and fintech and uh, different other segments but broadly will classify under the same verticals so if i see uh, a domain uh, i will try to evaluate somebody's domain expertise uh, in terms of four quadrants right uh, so uh, one will be the understanding of the job the job description will be always provided by the company which is hiring so that uh, that gives an insight about your roles and responsibility and what you are expected to do so uh, there you need to be a little uh, finicky about how things actually happen in the sales and marketing area rather than uh, in the uh, booking um, uh, in the in the book framework that uh, we have uh, for example i understand people are very familiar with uh, uh, the four p's and all these things but they're not a bit familiar about the sales funnel or how a sales review of pipeline happens which are the things that people in uh, this profession uh, do uh, day in and day out similar in consulting it consulting uh, people might be knowing the codings and configurations but then you have to understand the different uh, cycles the domains the blueprint of a um, um, uh, procurement process or a sales process so a high level understanding of things that exactly happen on a daily basis uh, or in a typical day of a manager there uh, uh, will perhaps give you a connect so the first quadrant uh, will be the job description understanding the job description uh, with context to how exactly things are done in the corporate uh, the second of course uh, is your previous work experience and if you do not have any work experience uh, then it could be your internship experience and if you are going for uh, your uh, sip without any work experience then it could be uh, similar to uh, certain things like uh, what what are your uh, uh, other things that you have done like you know extra extracurricular or co curricular things which are relevant to some work so uh, but typically we will be focusing on the work experience that somebody had during his uh, summer internship or during his uh, previous uh, company so that has to be related because uh, during your work you do a lot of things like in our role uh, we do a lot of things but when we are being interviewed for uh, finance i will not be talking about the things that i uh, did for uh, my marketing i might have done 90% of the things in marketing but then that do not uh, uh, comp comprise a lot of uh, aspect of uh, what the interviewer is looking for so the work experience uh, has to be related and relevant to what you are uh, saying then we see uh, the extracurricular and co-curricular that is the CV points. There again, I will uh, uh, emphasize that you should bring only those things like you've done some Coursera course or you have arranged certain things. I like in connect with uh, the role and responsibility. And the last but not the list, which often uh, begins and the first question that is invariably asked in an interview is to tell about yourself. So when you are telling about yourself, connect it uh, uh, because you will be giving a summary of what you uh, of your CV. And uh, don't expect that they have gone through your entire city and they have um, understood everything. So just give a, a, a summary of the entire thing in con connect with the, uh, the roles and responsibility while telling about yourself. Right? Don't go overboard in telling that I'm interested in doing a PhD or I'm interested in starting my own company because you are there for joining their company. So those kind of negations uh, should be avoided. Great, Rajesh. So next is on a uh, personal interview preparation you know what would you suggest all the folks here rajesh no, i think i uh, um, i have already uh, covered that uh, in that two by two matrix uh, that what we seek in a candidate when, when we are asking for uh, a job so in a pi um, uh, typically there will be uh, there will be questions from your uh, from your understanding uh, about that role and uh, there could be role plays also. So when you are uh, doing a role play kind of thing, uh, uh, you will try to evaluate uh, that how you can think at what will be your approach. And not necessarily that you'll be knowing uh, the answer. For example, if I ask that there is an objection handling question and I say that your prices are too high, so uh, you need not uh, go overboard in selling certain things. You need to know certain frameworks, like there is a value selling, right? So sometimes you have to sell the value of your product. You told about upselling. You told about cross-selling. Uh, we discussed about the sales funnel. So uh, there is a model for feature advantage benefit. There is a model for TCO, that is the total cost of ownership. We are talking about zero cost of ownership now. So you have to understand the frames so that you understand uh, that what the interviewer is thinking. You can, if, you're, if you can go inside the mind of the interviewer by knowing uh, what he's exactly asking, then you can immediately connect with the same model. So that is what we can discuss maybe. Uh, the several models that are available, uh, the IDA model, the AICC model. So if we are thorough about those things, we'll be able to think uh, better and do better in that. Great, great, Rajesh. And the last is on the mentoring part. 
And uh, you want to add anything here, Rajesh, before the closing statement? I think uh, Exanti is a great mentorship uh, uh, plan. I mentor Anuj. I was very happy that he called me the other day and said that he got a PPI. So uh, I would uh, request the student to take advantage of the mentoring, uh, uh, mentoring of, of uh, facility research provided by Exanti. Many of the people volunteer for that. So they pull out time from their busy schedule. Do take advantage of that. Uh, if you have been allotted a mentor, do talk to them during your SIP, do talk to them in your initial days. So um, it's not that they may, they may not be from your industry, but there is a framework based upon which every industry works and that uh, skeleton remains same. There will be the administration and management part remains same. The product and process might change here and there, but uh, the framework remains same. So we somewhat need to guide you, uh, do take advantage of this. Right. right, absolutely, uh, Rajesh. And as Rajesh said, you know, XIMB is maybe one of the finest institutions, which has a great, uh, you know, platform for interaction with the alumni, with the faculties, and with all the students, prospective students as well. Right. So uh, take advantage of that. I personally took advantage of that, and uh, I, I would say it really pays off well. And uh, nothing more, you know, helps uh, mentors think that the mentees have excelled in their lives, right? So with this, I think we overshot our time, guys. But uh, let's keep it open for the Q and A. If you have any questions, happy to answer. Thank you, speakers, for the profound session. We learned a lot from you. Uh, now the platform is open for Q and A. I request the students to please use the raise hand feature. I would take your names one by one. You can then unmute yourself and proceed with your question. Thank you, Harsh. So, Mehbat, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, sir. Hey, hi. My name is Soumya. I'm from XIMB BM Batch of 2022. So, my question to you is that how does a company check on the health of its partnerships, especially when it's new? Fantastic, fantastic, right? So, uh, long answer short how do you check the health of your partnership firm you know you ask them hey can you share me the annual revenue of last two years three years five years jo 99 chances mein look nahi denge. <laughs> right they will say hey, i'm a closed company we are not listed in you know shanghai stock exchange or new york stock exchange and will not give you so what are the other means of doing that right so the other mean is asking them questions right and what would be the questions? The first question would be, how much is the strength of your sales team, and where are you located? So you would be, you know, you, you would be aware that okay, it's a local company based out of Johannesburg, or it's a global company based out of Nairobi, and it's uh, having all its branches across, right? Secondly, you know, you need to look at the website. You know, you uh, once you get the website, you will come to know your yeah, professional website, hai, yeah, very, final year ke students milke hai ye website, right? So that's how you will do it, and Last but not the least, you should talk with all their stakeholders, you know, right from the CEO, you know, attempt to talk with the CEO. So if not with the CEO, you will talk with the SVP. If not with the SVP, you will talk with an EVP, you know, so that's how you will do it. But I think the best part is getting the annual revenue sheets, if not asking them questions about the sales bandwidth. So a material of what your technology team is, your technology team could be a good hundred, you know, powered, uh, you know, car, you know, uh, business unit, but your sales team, how effective they are, would be known by how many personals are there, how many geographies they're covering. So that should be a go-to question. And nice if I question. add, uh, Sapnil, uh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, uh, there are dedicated companies like Onikra and Trisil who work on that thing, uh, the partner uh, risk uh, estimation. So they have a complete format where they evaluate, like Sapnil said, they, they, uh, we will take a permission from them uh, that we want to evaluate that thing. And then they give a complete report based upon their financial portfolio. Their if they have any um, uh, financial, they've done any financial fraud. What if whether they are politically exposed or not? Uh, they have a complete report format. Onikra and Trisil and there are a lot of other uh, service providers who give a complete report. So typically we outsource that uh, and we get the final report based upon the health of the partner. Great. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Soumya. Uh, Vabal Srivastava, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, enriching session, sir. Sir, I have a question uh, based on some situational analysis. I want to get to know more about the partnership thing. So, sir, uh, my, uh, uh, I, what I've seen is that uh, when, as you talked about OEM partnerships, 
so sir uh, in oem partnership there are two different segments which are involved which is one is the technical one and other is the more towards the marketing one uh, towards the marketer uh, marketing approach one so sir how can a partnership be grown between these two different separate entities where uh, the technical persons are not knowing about the real market requirements which is present in this in, in the industry sir so how can there be a good relationship between them excellent you know webhav so i think you have asked the classic questions here webhav that why do organizations fail you know organizations fail if they definitely work in silos or for that matter you know in your personal life or professional life you know if you do not communicate and if you're working in silos definitely you would not be you know working at your optimum 100% potential right so yeah the, the, the classic case over here is you know and this is where the partnership manager comes in the picture you know there are a lot of folks who undermine partnership as a non technical sales role right so partnership of course is a sales role it's a 70% sales role you know but i would say it's a 10% technical role 10% legal and or you know obviously the rest 10% is on your corporate finance and doing your due diligence right so uh, i think the partnership manager here holds the key so there will be a marketing team you know there will be the global marketing evp who will drive his or her agenda there would be the technology you know the, you know so, you know chief architect who would be driving his agenda so for example let me take this you know lenovo you know lenovo uh, is coming up with new vr headsets so vr is your head mounted virtual reality and uh, let me also share uh, with you you know a leading consultants company like bain and company mckinsey at kearney they are no more using you know uh, you know handbooks handbooks like this you know when you come uh, down uh, to uh, you know you you are a fresher and you have joined mckinsey and mckinsey will not hand over you uh, yellow yaar hr ka documentation as sab padho aur sign karo and de do what they will do is they will provide you vr headsets and using the vr headsets you have to magically and you know practically score the questions and answers that you know it would be more of an immersive training google the word immersive learning and you will come to know more about this so you know so lenovo as the oem would need hardwares you know softwares uh, you know to be fixed on their hardware so that they can manage monitor and secure all this vr headsets so over here the technology team will definitely drive up they will do the technical due diligence they will do the uh, technology integration api integration sdk integrations and all that stuff the marketing team will start flashing it or uh, you know on the social media news sets stating that you know 42 gears partners with lenovo for creating a you know next generation learning for mckinsey and at kearney and all that but you as a partnership manager have to be the bridge between the technology team the marketing team you know in order to tell the marketing team ki guys you have to write it in this way you have to review their work you have to audit their work and not only with marketing team uh, you know uh, web hub you would also need to work with the legal team telling that you know this technology integration does not infringe my copyright it keeps 42 gears safe right so i think that's a good question but there is a lot more answers that i can give you but for starters understand that it would be the onus of the partnership manager if the partnership fails nobody is getting fired your head will roll if you do not be you know take care of the safety checks so you should you know be the bridge thank you sir that answers yeah. my question thank you sir thank you very much nishay and anmute uh, yourself and ask the question thank you so much sir it was a really interesting talk my question is around the cultural barriers that we face uh, when two companies go for partnerships for so for example there is sometimes that the partnership didn't work out because of the cultural differences or it or the second part of the question can be about the positioning so mm-hmm. what i feel about skoda is that it wants to uh, be in the premium segment but then it is not able to generate enough sales in the premium segment because we have higher likes of say audi when you want to target the premium range for example when we talk about superb and we all know that skoda cars are manufactured in the same plant as audi ones are manufactured so they have that uh, thing into the making of cars that they want to make premium cars but to get that chunk of the market segment they just don't have enough brand name as audi has so i feel that it can be sometimes of a misfit that you want to be people's choice 
but then you are not probably in the right segment and this in collaboration with the cultural differences if you could share some light on that rajesh yeah it's a difficult question <laughs> over to you <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that has been traditionally the case for any foreign entrant in India. It has never been easy to have uh, followed the automotive industry closely. You know, a lot of foreign player, including General Manager, has uh, uh, sorry, General Motors has uh, exited India. So, uh, see, the uh, you're absolutely right. I will just give you the case of uh, a real life case by, uh, uh, from my own experience. You're absolutely right. It is the segmentation that's a problem. So when Mercedes Benz uh, uh, was uh, uh, coming into in India, uh, it was always considered as a very expensive uh, brand. So they decided to launch as uh, uh, Marat Benz, right? Uh, so even after that, even after changing uh, their name from Mercedes Benz to Marat Benz, it was considered as a very pricey uh, truck, and uh, they were not able to compete with uh, the likes of Tata and Asok Leyland because of the brand perception. So uh, you are absolutely right uh, that uh, when uh, you say Skoda, because uh, of uh, uh, there are the, of the cultural barrier people perhaps perceive that this is uh, and this is this doesn't have the of the same brand value as an audi or a mercedes but why it is so pricey right so uh, that is how uh, they are getting the pinch and that's why this uh, uh, skoda 2 project uh, is, uh, is also taking into account the Volkswagen group where they are trying to uh, even the field where you are not only competing with uh, uh, the premium segment of audi and uh, uh, Mercedes, you are also uh, trying to come take some pie uh, from uh, Hondas and Toyotas and uh, uh, Hyundai's, right? They are also competing with uh, Hyundai Elantra and they are also competing with the Toyota Corolla. So uh, that's 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 what the strategy is, perhaps, uh, to even out the uh, segment. So I will go with you. Yes, there is a cultural barrier in terms of understanding what is premium and what is not premium. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rish. Uh, Tulsi, you can go ahead and ask a question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Tulsi Acharya from Exam BPM Batch of 2022. So, uh, my question is to Rajesh, sir. Uh, like, as you mentioned about the premium car brand, so we know that in commercial car brands also, we have seen a, a major setback. So, how do you think that partnership can help to regain this uh, market uh, using local vendors and uh, supply chain systems. Uh, Tulsi, you're talking about the commercial cars or commercial trucks? Uh, commercial cars, sir. Commercial car and taxis, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, be it any segment, I always believe that uh, the partnership, uh, there are two, uh, if, I, if I see it as a simplistic model, then you will have vendor partners and you will have channel partners. So the, uh, there are two aspects to it. The vendor partners will help us with reduction of cost and uh, just-in-time supply, which again is a problem because inventory is the biggest cost in any manufacturing in, uh, industry. So if my uh, my vendor partners can ramp up their capacity to meet the demand fluctuation at my end, then my inventory cost will not go up. At the same time, if I'm localizing the product while maintaining the same quality that of my European counterparts, if they can have that quality system in place, you will come to know in your project management course or if you have gone through it, there are always 15, 16 check gates in a product uh, uh, introduction cycle or even if when we are changing a part, right? you'll have bill of material release and then it is an inspected and if you have the tolerance limits uh, accepted, then only it will be uh, a go ahead. So the, I'll be expecting the vendor partners to ramp up their capacity to train their manpower and to, uh, to upgrade their tools and equipments to cater to the need of the quality requirement. And at the same time, to have their softwares in place where uh, the variations uh, uh, in demand can be taken care. Uh, at the same time, uh, if I the, uh, having taken care of the, uh, the supply part, I have to also ensure that the demand forecasting is done right. So your dealer partners are the people who are closest to the market. So they give you the forecasting, right? Uh, despite all the tools in place, be it Salesforce or any CRM software, it is eventually some human intervention that is needed to have a rolling plan. So I need to foresee how a market in Bhubaneswar uh, uh, is uh, doing that will be completely different from how a market in Kolkata or from a market in Coimbatore. So these are all variations because uh, of the different geography and different uh, level of aspiration of people. So I will expect my sales uh, team uh, through my channel partners to go to the market, talk to the customer, understand their sentiment, and then give a correct forecasting. 
and at the same time i also uh, need uh, my channel partners presence in terms of service because sales uh, is always supported by service and availability of spare parts because sales happen one time service happens many times in the life of a customer so you need the presence of your partners um, uh, dealer partners rather in different hubs where the customers are concentrated taking care of their need and understanding their set, uh, sentiment and giving a feedback to the company which is sitting in ahmedabad or pune or in delhi in metropolitan so that uh, the demand side and supply side both are taken care of thank you sir thank you tulsi so due to paucity of time we'll take one last question uh, mr gupta you can unmute yourself and ask the question Good afternoon, sir. Thanks a lot for the insightful session. Sir, my question is that uh, now that second wave of pandemic is already hitting a lot of countries, what are some major takeaways from the past one year that are going to boost sales that we can implement to boost sales uh, while we don't know how long the pandemic is going to last? So, what are the takeaways? Is my question. Right. Right. Fantastic. Uh... Mishti, uh, thank you so much for this question. I think it's very relevant that uh, the Corona pandemic is going to stay with us for a while. You know, it's not going to leave us, and we need to adapt and you know adjust ourselves. You know, as they say, this pandemic is the new normal here, right? So. you know getting sales sales of course has been hit you know there have been couple of organizations where sales have moved up uh, you know in this pandemic because you know the pandemic has entrusted people of using you know the virtual scenarios you know for example zoom we are using zoom so if you see the sales growth of zoom has quadrupled in the last you know three quarters but there were other companies where sales have been hit right and uh, there is no magic bullet there is no silver bullet to tell you or how you should strategize in order to grow and you know move your targets meet your targets in this pandemic but you know one thing that is pretty sure is that um, you know we were meeting face to face with all the sales persons you know working in global partnerships but right now the you know discussion is more on the virtual scenarios so a couple of do's and don'ts on the virtual scenarios you need to be aware of in order to ensure that your communication is as appropriate as possible with the other you know gentleman or lady uh, sitting there right and apart from that you know you have to rely heavily on the marketing staff right because if you can't meet face to face if you can't have a conference face to face what you can only do is have a virtual conference have a virtual meet and put out your messaging on the social media on you know various campaigns run various campaigns and conferences virtually to try to meet your uh, you know market segment but i would say you know uh, mishti you cannot uh, you, you do not have a silver bullet you would need to accept that your sales will be lesser but you need to be innovative enough to find how you best you can you know sell it off, uh, across you know so there is no fixed template over it the only thing i would say is think innovate and try to do as much things as possible don't repeat the same mistake again try to make multiple mistakes and try to see which one works best for you uh, i think th this is what i would answer right Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you, speakers, for answering the questions. I'm sure they are going to benefit the students in the long run. Now, I'd Bye. like to ask Kasturi Das, a core member of the alumni committee, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Swapnil sir and Rajesh sir and all the students. Bye. On behalf of the alumni committee, I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our alumni. and esteemed panel for today mr swapnil sahu and mr rajesh sarangi taking out time on a sunday and providing this enriching session i can undoubtedly say that the industry insights pertaining to the partnerships and alliances and tips and suggestions to ace the placements provided to the students shall surely help them moving forward i would also like to thank our students for being such an enriching uh, for such uh, for such an engaging audience last but not the least a special mention to the career advisory services and student executive council for their constant support helping us make this event a success thank you everyone have a good day thank you so much kasturi and thank you the whole alumni team you know uh, last but not the least i would also like to thank neha who has been constantly engaging with me you know uh, even when i was abroad and now i'm here so thank you everybody uh, rajesh you want to add anything maybe we have taken a lot of their lunch thank you everyone uh, It was a good talk to the last night. It was the last night. It was really a good talk.
Uh, Rajesh, you know, the voice problem has uh, been reoccurring now. So I think, yeah. Some, yeah, I think now it is better. Yeah, I, uh, it was because of the bandwidth issue. So I yeah. just wanted to thank that after 2018, uh, I got to speak to the students uh, once again. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, so participating and pulling out time that Sunday afternoon. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, and have a happy lunch, have, happy Sunday, and feel free to ask us more questions. I'm sure that you would have more questions, and we don't have so much of bandwidth here, but uh, happy to answer you. You can connect me over LinkedIn, or you can take my number from the alumni, and we can you know converse uh, accordingly. Yeah. Sure. So th uh, thank you, speakers. Uh, so we have come to the end of the proceedings. We request everyone to stay on call as the speakers take our leave. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Swapna. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.